I've only been in ministry 40 years. And I have discovered that some congregations will drive you to drink and I came prepared. <laughs> Relax, it's only caffeine. <laughs> Hallelujah. God gave me a word for you. I, I had, <clears throat> see all the notes on there? I had uh, worked out what I thought I was going to teach this morning. And uh, then uh, Pastor Neil said, uh, did you come with a word for us? And so in faith, I answered yes. <laughs> well, I thought I had one. <laughs> and while we, were <laughs> while we were over here in worship, the Lord said, you tell them I am coming to visit them. That's when I got the word, was here in worship, the specific word for your congregation. You tell them I am coming to worship them and I am going to activate the heart of David in this people. The heart of David. I'm going to activate the heart of David in this people. Now, Fortunately, I'm trusting, I'm flying without a flight plan. I've been trained to do that. I was a Navy pilot in Vietnam. I got 161 combat missions under my belt. I have done battle with MiGs and I came out, I'm here. That means I was victorious. Yes. Hello. Yes. I have been chased by the best. And, uh, and I, I wasn't armed. I was flying a spy plane. There were only two airplanes like the one I flew uh, back in the day when I was in. There were only two in existence. And we did all the Meg and Sam threat warning over North Vietnam. So anytime there was any air activity, Navy, Marines, Air Force, anybody who was flying over the North, we were mandated to be on track and provide them protection. Surface air missile protection, MIG protection. And so... We had 30 on, 30 off. We were in the air all the time. And so that's my training. That was my background. I wanted to be an airline pilot. I spent an extra tour in Vietnam to be an airline pilot. They, they didn't have enough trainers for the guys coming up. And the CEO said, would you uh, take another tour? And I said, well, I really don't want to. I want to go out and get my, my airline job. And he said, man, we don't have anybody to train pilots. We're in a, we're in a real fix. I said, okay, all right, I'll do it. Well, when I got, my father was on the draft board and he was a real man of integrity for a politician that's saying something. You really want to know why I'm in Australia? You, you really want to know why I drink out of a Bubba keg? I, I can tell you, take a look at his running for president. Now, wouldn't that drive you to go visit Australia? Are you kidding me? There's hardly any sanity left in my country. It's nearly all, all gone. Oh, man. What a zoo. Only a Hillary Clinton could drive you to think about voting for a Donald Trump. I'd actually kind of like to see somebody go to D.C. and say, you're fired, you're fired, you're fired, you're fired. <laughs> so thanks for having me on my sabbatical to sanity while I'm out here. I really appreciate it. I heard God. Heard him right there. Heard, heard what he said to you. Now, I'm going to have to fly without a flight plan this morning and unpack this as best I can on the spot. It's, it's not enough to declare to you a prophetic word. I have to show you what that word means in yes. scripture. Yes. I mean, it's really not fair just to come dump a word on you and not give any definition because that leaves way too much room for misinterpretation. And we've had, uh, 
too much of that in the body of Christ. All right, so we're going to start in Revelation 22. Since you were singing this morning out of Revelation, I thought, you know what? This would be perfect. We'll start in Revelation 22. What does it mean when the Lord says to you, I am going to visit your church, I'm going to visit your body, and I'm going to activate the heart of David on the inside of you? What does that mean? And I don't want somebody's interpretation. I want chapter and verse. I want you to show me from this book what that means. Okay? So that's what I'm asking God for. I mean, I, my faith is on the line right now for the Lord. I don't have any notes for this. It's got to come by the Holy Ghost. And you ought to catch the wind of the Spirit. I feel like I'm back in the cockpit again. Yikes. That'll get the adrenaline flowing. <laughs> oh, God. Do you mind? I'm... I'm old enough, I get a few war stories. Is that okay? I never forget the first time they sent MiGs out after us because we weren't armed. We had to, and there were only two planes. They couldn't afford, they could care less about losing us. They couldn't afford to lose a plane because they couldn't replace it. All right, so we had F-4 protection all the time, fully armed, locked and loaded missiles, guns, all nine yards. Well, the F-4s every once in a while had to go back to carrier and uh, retool, retrench, refuel, all the stuff. And so sometimes they were a little late getting the replacements. So when they hadn't launched the replacements and our F-4 protection was gone, we were only allowed to fly right outside the surface-to-air missile envelope in North Vietnam, 30 miles. We flew 32 miles up and down Haiphong Harbor so we could cover the whole area and so we could see everything. We had a crew of 30, multi-million dollars worth of electric, uh, electronic equipment. Anybody emitting anything, we had it. We scoped it and uh, all of our guys were back. We had spooks, CIA spooks on board. We had 10 of those. They were doing all the language stuff. And then we had all the operators. So, I mean, it, it was a, a real operation in the air. And so the enemy would wait because they monitored all of our stuff too. They would wait until the F-4s were back to the carrier and the replacements hadn't come out yet. And then they would launch their MiGs at us because we were a primary target. So, and all we could do it was a 180 max power off airframe dive and you pushed it all the way to terminal velocity. We go any faster, the wings come off, the skin peels off. All right, it's the first time I experienced that. I experienced it more than once. I'll tell you, when God puts you in situations like that, it's a learning experience. Yeah, you can learn whether you're gonna survive or not. Here's what I noticed. My co-pilot was frozen. Because I had to, to, the crew said, okay, the MiGs are after us. They're, they're uh, max speed. They, they've dropped their tanks. They're coming out at 1,200 knots. They're going to intercept us in 90 seconds, and we are four minutes from the carrier. So all we do is a 180 and straight down. Now we push max airframe. We, we're right up to that speed. The plane's starting to do this. And I'm looking over and barking orders and my co-pilot's frozen. It's like he's in molasses. <laughs> Something's happened to him. I don't know what it is. He's in slow motion. And I'm having to do my stuff on my side of the cockpit. And I mean, this is a giant cockpit. We got a flight engineer in between us and we got four giant engines out there. You know, uh, radomes hanging all over the place. We're fat, dumb and happy, low and slow. Here comes the enemy. And all of a sudden within 30 seconds, you are exactly 90 seconds from death and destruction being shot out of the air. And I have to reach over on his side of the cockpit and flip his switches because he's, something's happened. Well, fortunately, we ended up getting away. We escaped by no fault of our own. That was a grace day. But I started saying, what was that? And God said to me, he missed a nearly fatal part of preparation. 
He never made the decision that what he was doing was worth dying for. And because he never made that decision, when he got in that situation, he entered paralysis. And he was frozen. It's like he couldn't respond. He just couldn't move. I realized something right then about the Christian life. When you recognize that God has brought you into something that's worth dying for, and you make that decision, God, I'm all in. When you're all in, covenantally, you have access to everything God has. But he will wait till he sees your heart is all in. Then there's no paralysis for you in any situation of danger where you face. You can move, you can think, you can talk, you can move by the Holy Spirit for one reason. You've already made this decision. You've crossed over the covenantal line. King of kings, here's my hand, here's my heart, I'm all in. Now, one of the things that's a requirement for a people, if God is going to activate the heart of David for you, it requires you being all in. And I believe I'm in a congregation of people that have been all in, and many of you have proved it for decades. Hello? All right. So I believe that line's crossed. That's not an issue. All right, when God does this, what does it look like? Revelation chapter 22. Did I mention that? Okay, you're there. Verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the. Do you have a red letter edition? Is that in red? Whose mouth speaking it? Jesus. I am the. Root. And fruit of David. Wow. How does Jesus identify himself to the end time church in the book of Revelation? I am the root and offspring of David. I'm not the suffering servant anymore, I'm resurrected took a seat at the right hand of God. I am the root and the fruit. If you want to know what I look like, look at King David. Because that's what I look like in the end times. I look like King David. That is what Jesus is saying to the church. And I heard him. I heard him right there in that seat where Pastor Neil is right now, standing up, worshiping with you. I heard Jesus say, you tell him, I am coming to visit and I'm going to activate the heart of David in this house. This is what it looks like. All right, next thing that looks like, that's, that's still not enough. To, uh, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount, verse 15. Matthew 5, right after the Beatitudes. You are the, Matthew 5, verse 13. You are the salt Salt, salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Now, in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came and Peter is trying to give, I'm, I'm putting my hand in Matthew 5, I'm coming right back, and I'm going to Acts chapter 2 because we have a little King David input here. Matter of fact, King David input is all through the New Testament. The most concise, topical description of the end times is written by King David at Psalm 2. Why did the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth took counsel and set themselves together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bands in pieces and tear their cords from us. Psalm 2 is an outline of what's going to unfold. It's how the enemy comes against the church, and it's how the church rises up and gives its testimony in the last days. Psalm 2, written by King David, came right out of his life. All right? 
Now, listen to this. Acts chapter two, verse 32. This is Peter on the day of Pentecost stands up to preach. This Jesus God has raised up of which we're all witnesses. Therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David, David, King David, did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly. That is the Greek idiom of a husband and a wife who come together and produce children. Spiritually speaking, God wants spiritual fruit out of the two distinct ministries of the Lord Jesus Christ. God has, no, assuredly, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both kurios and Christos, Lord and Christ, kurios, judge of all the earth, Christos, savior of all the earth. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, kurios, judge of all the earth, Christos, savior of all the earth. Who got the word? about making our enemies our footstool. What prophet in the Old Testament got that word? King David. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of his strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemy. Psalm 110 verses one and two, King David. King David. If God's gonna come and he's gonna activate the heart of King David in this congregation, you are gonna look like the Christ who identifies himself as King David in Revelation chapter 22. And that has two distinct manifestations. Kurios Christos, savior of all the earth, judge of all the earth. Now most of us have spent our life in preparation to represent savior of all the earth. And we are quite familiar with savior of all the earth. Mercy, mercy, mercy. He's the God of mercy. He's the God of salvation. But that's not all he is. He's more than that. He is the judge of all the earth. And if he is going to make our enemies our footstool, the two-edged sword of mercy is what you can expect when the heart of David is activated on the inside of you. Now there's coming out not a single-edged sword, priestly salvation. No, it's two-edged sword. Everybody say two-edged sword. Priestly salvation, kingly justice. So when we go back to the Sermon on the Mount, and we read Matthew chapter five. See, here, here is the other, if the enemy is not your footstool, here's the other side of that. If we only get one half of who God is, then the enemy starts walking on us. And verse 13 says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. If we walk in the covenant of King David with the anointing of King David, we walk on the enemy. He makes our enemy our footstool. If somehow we lose our saltiness, our flavor, whatever that means or however that happens, the enemy walks on us. If you lose your salt, the enemy walks on us. Now, what if we wake up and find we're the product of 50 years ago, the enemy attacked our seminaries and he started draining off the salt that previous generations had. And all of a sudden we wake up and we have spent our whole life growing into one half of who Christ is. What is the salt that Jesus is, you are the salt of the earth. What is he talking about? We have to go back to 2 Chronicles chapter 13. All right, 2 Chronicles 13, verse 3. Now, two kings are at war. 
King Jeroboam, he has 10 tribes. And Abijah, he has two tribes. Okay? Abijah, the guy with two tribes, says to the king with 10 tribes, do not go to battle with us today. You can't win. And there's a reason why you can't win. We have the covenant. We have a pure altar. We have obeyed our God and the priests and the Levites are doing what they are commanded to do. And you let anybody come into the priest, priesthood. You, you have completely uh, defiled the priesthood. And anybody can buy a position. It's for sale over in your kingdom. But we have chosen to maintain the pure altar and we are doing the word of the living God. Don't go to war with us. You can't win. And he's outnumbered two to one. Abijah's outnumbered two to one. Listen to where his salt comes from. Why? Because it's the foundation. It's, a, it's coming on your life. I heard it right there. I'm telling you, when Jesus comes and activates the heart of David in this congregation, you are getting a baptism of salt. Some of you look kind of salty already. <laughs> that sort of grows with age, though, doesn't it? You get more and more where I don't care so much what people think anymore. God, I don't know how much time I have left, but I want to make it count. In 2013, I went in for routine surgery, died twice, left my body. I have been where you are going. I have seen Jesus face to face. You are looking at a living reject from heaven. <laughs> Brother, not everybody's mean enough to get sent back. You know that, that takes real talent. <laughs> I'm not sure the kind of talent anybody wants. But <laughs> I have been there. I've been there twice. I walked among the saints. We all knew we were there by mercy. There wasn't any pride. There wasn't any arrogance. There wasn't anybody trumpeting anything that they had done on the earth. We all knew we were there by the mercy of God. And the second time I was there, Jesus got in my face and gave me a message for the leadership of the church and sent me back. And that's the real reason why I'm here. So I, I'll tell you what dying does. <laughs> it, it sets you free from what anybody thinks about anything. <laughs> You just don't care anymore. <laughs> uh, I'll drink to that. <laughs> you know, it is really fun to be free enough to just say what you hear God say, whether people want to hear it or whether they don't, just to give them the pure without any diminishing the word, to say it the way you hear it. And you know what? I sense there's a heart to hear what God wants to say, whether it hurts or whether it doesn't. And I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for being that kind of congregation who says to the Lord out of your heart, says, God, I want all you have. I want to hear what you have to say, and I want it straight. Don't diminish it. Give it to me straight up. Then I'll know what I need to do. Thank you for being that kind of people. It's no wonder the Lord said, I'm visiting this house and I'm going to activate the heart of David. Hallelujah. Now the wind blew my spot away. All right, second cry. 13, here we go. 13, look at it, verse 3. Abijah set the battle in order with an army of valiant warriors, 400,000 choice men. Jeroboam also drew up in battle formation against him, 800,000. Two to one, he's outnumbered. Then Abijah stood on Mount uh, Zemarim, which is in the mountains of Ephraim, and said, Hear me, O Jeroboam, and all Israel. Should you not know the Lord God of Israel? Verse 5, circle verse 5. Now that is very important for what's about to happen when the Lord visits you and activates the heart of David. Should you not know that the Lord God of Israel gave the dominion over Israel to David forever to him and his sons by a covenant of salt? When Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, what he was saying is you are the covenant people of King David and 
You're about to be ratified in that covenant by the resurrected Christ. The longest message the Apostle Paul preached in the entire New Testament is in Acts chapter 13. And guess what it gives definition to? It gives definition to what's about to happen in your house, what's about to happen in your heart. Oh, go to Acts chapter 13. All right. Oh, by the way, in Acts 13 is also you got a manifestation of Christos and Kurios. You've got it in the life of the Apostle Paul. And then you begin to understand why did God make Jesus, whom we crucified, Kurios, judge of all the earth, and Christos, Savior of all the earth. Because the harvest is often hidden behind enemy lines. And in order to gain your assigned harvest, you often have to go judicial to break through those enemy lines to gain the priestly harvest Christ died for. All right, now that example is here in Acts 13. And it's in the life of the Apostle Paul. He is sent into this region, but he can't get a visa. The reason he can't get a visa is because the politician has a false prophet who's making sure that Paul can't get in. And so what we have is this conflict. Two men full of the respective gods they serve. All right, listen to these verses. This is your picture of what the fullness of Christ looks like on the judicial side, okay? Verse 9, Acts 13, 9. Then Saul also is called Paul, filled with filled, Paul's full of the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, oh, full. Okay, Paul's full of the Holy Spirit. His enemy is filled with demons. So you got fullness of the demonic against fullness of the Holy Spirit. Verse 10, oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness. How long will you cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? Now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately the dark mist fell on him. He went around and seeking somebody, leading him by the hand. And the proconsul said, here's your visa. Go do whatever you want to do. This is a manifestation of the judicial Christ in action. Now please jump over, same chapter, Acts chapter 13. Now some of you are going to look like this. Acts 13, verse 32. Longest recorded message of the Apostle Paul in the entire New Testament. We declare to you glad tidings, that promise which is made to the fathers, God has fulfilled this for us, our children, in that he raised up Jesus, as is also written in the second Psalm. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Oh, wow. Look at verse 34. And that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus. This is Jesus on Resurrection Day. Acts 13, 34, what does it say? I give you the sure mercies of David. All right, one more passage, maybe. Because we have to define. I'm I'm trying to paint the full picture of what's coming in Scripture when the Lord activates the heart of David in your life. Now, part of it is you get a lot more salty than you are right now. You get concerning the righteousness of the king inflexible because you represent the God who created the heavens and the earth. Hello? And if your assigned harvest field is behind enemy lines, God gives you the salt to break through the enemy lines, whatever that may be. Now, if, God, if Jesus says to us, I give you the same covenant I gave King David, the only thing I know to do is go back and look in the same passage where God gave the covenant to King David and then draw out of that some conclusions about what that means. So, please go to 2 Samuel chapter 7. This is where uh, the Lord gave King David his covenant. Same one Jesus declared on us on resurrection day. Now, please look at somebody and say, this is yours. This is yours. It's about to be activated in your midst. This is coming. This is coming on your life. I, 
I'm not going to apologize for it. <laughs> yeah, now, you may not like it. It may drive you to a Bubba keg also. <laughs> but you'll love the fruit because the fruit's eternal. The fruit of the living Christ, what he does in our midst is so that we can possess the fullness of the harvest we were assigned before the foundations of the earth. Now that's the whole purpose. The purpose is God, and you notice something about God? He doesn't seem to care about how old you are. He likes giving us promises when we're kids. Joshua and Caleb. And then he'll wait around until you're 85 just to see if you still want it. That's the kind of God you and I are dealing with who doesn't seem to consider the aches and pains of age at all. Doesn't seem to be an issue with him. Maybe because he's the healer. Maybe it's because he's the revitalizer. He's the rebuilder of hearts. He's the rebuilder of knees. He's the replacer of hips. He's got a whole room and it's all full of them. And he says, I will give you what you need to carry out my assignment on your life. You will run and not be weary. You will walk and not faint in Jesus' name. That's a God you and I serve. And he acts like it. And he expects us to step up to it. And it's because of the call. We, we have to have his healing power to finish the call on our life. We don't have any choice. We have to trust him to reactivate, uh, renew these bodies, rebuild. And every once in a while you look in the mirror and you think, holy mackerel, I'm a bionic man. I got to do this, I got to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I've been rebuilt practically every way you can rebuild somebody. And lo and behold, it all works occasionally. It does take a little anesthesia, however. All right. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now, I want you to look at this. There are two key elements to pull out of this. Two key elements. Verse 9 and then verse 14 and 15. Verse 9. I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you and have made you a great name like the name of the great men who are in the earth. Covenant Davidic mercy is a two-edged sword. Covenant mercy in verse 15 redeems all of our failures. The Lord asked me one time, when did I speak to my servant David about his son Solomon before or after he met Bathsheba? I said, God, I don't know. We said, go find out. Second Samuel 7, God spoke to him about his son Solomon who would build the temple. Four chapters later, he meets Bathsheba. God looked ahead, saw his failure of adultery and murder gave him a covenant of sure mercy and redeemed it before he ever got there. That's the God who when he called us to his purpose, when he gave us an assignment for his kingdom, looked down over our life, he saw every mistake, he saw every failure, and he redeemed it before we ever got there. And here's the promise of Isaiah 55. Because this is in Isaiah 55. The promise of Isaiah 55 is when you and I stop criticizing the failures of people and start redeeming them, nations will run to us. When you and I stop criticizing the failures of people and start redeeming them, the nations will run to us. I don't have time to read it, but it's at Isaiah 55, one through six. It's right there. And it's about the covenant of sure mercy. All right, the covenant of sure mercy is a two-edged sword. All right, two-edged sword. Do you remember last scripture, go to Psalm 143. Do you remember when King David lost Jerusalem? 
to his own son. Remember that? He lost Jerusalem to his own son. He's outnumbered. The only thing King David can do is pray. All right? Is pray. And what does King David do? In Psalm 143, he prays. Now, in the treasury of Scripture knowledge, it will tell you, it's the only place I found it, at the beginning of Psalm 143, this psalm was written on David's way out of Jerusalem. It says so in the Septuagint, the Vulgate, the Ethiopic, and the Arabic text. But if you read English, treasury of Scripture knowledge, that's where I got it. Look in verse 12. He has lost Jerusalem. His own son has taken it. How does King David pray? He has a covenant of sure mercy. Would you look at somebody and say, you have the same covenant? In your mercy, cut off. What did we just read in verse 9 of 2 Samuel 7? I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all of your enemies from before you. In your mercy, cut off. My enemies, destroy all those who afflict my soul, for I am your servant. And God not only put Ab- Absalom wouldn't turn and repent, put him in the grave, Ahithophel, his own best friend and counselor, who just happened to be Bathsheba's grandfather. I mean, David just didn't pick any chick to fool around with. He picked his best friend's granddaughter. And Ahithophel said, I will uh, raise up an army. I will pursue him. I will find out where he is, and I will strike him this night. 2 Samuel 17. It's right there. And the problem is Ahithophel is the greatest counselor in all of Israel. His word is like the oracles of God. And David said, Hushai, you can't help me. Stay behind. Maybe you can defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel. And you want to see how David prayed for Ahithophel? It's, it's recorded in Psalm 55. Read it. It's one of the toughest prayers in Scripture. Here's what you learn. When, when, here's what I'm trying to say to you. Mercy is a two-edged sword. Mercy can be used judicially. And if you never learn to pray mercy judicially, Luke 17, G, I'm sorry, Luke 18 Jesus taught us to pray judicially. You know, it's, it's the uh, widow, avenge me of my adversary. That's about prayer. Jesus taught that. He taught you and I to pray that. Okay, so if I have a covenant of sure mercy, and let's say I have a son or I have a daughter, and they're captured by the deception of homosexuality. Now, I want them in the kingdom. I love them. I'm not willing to let them stay in that deception. Because if they stay there, they're not making it into heaven. I want them out of that. I want them into heaven. So how do I pray? I am going to pray judicially over them. Father, I invoke the covenant of sure mercy over my son and over my daughter. Now they're in captivity. They're in a deception. And Father, I ask that the sword of the Spirit find them in Jesus' name and cut that, kept, that uh, deception off. Lord, I ask you to separate them from any unholy physical alliance in Jesus. Let your sword drop between them and anybody that they're hooking up with that they don't belong hooking up with. I declare your word over their life. Acts 16, 31, you said it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You and your house shall be saved. Therefore, I'm saying it, angel of the Lord, go get them right now. They're in the kingdom in Jesus' name. They just don't know it yet. You... You always use the judicial to gain the greater harvest. You always use the judicial. Look, nobody likes praying judicially because praying judicially has potential devastating fallout. I've been with you, David, wherever you've gone, and I have cut off all your enemies. Look around, you can't find them anymore. They're dead. I'll put them in the grave. Nobody likes to pray judicially. But you only go into the judicial when the Holy Spirit pushes you there to gain the greater harvest. The first manifestation of judicial prayer is in Genesis chapter uh, 18 with um, Abraham. His family is in Sodom and Gomorrah. They're going down to check it out and see if it's as bad as the outcry. And God meets with Abraham and said, I know Abraham. He will keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and to do judgment. 
And so Abraham starts doing judgment. But what kind of ju- very first manifestation of a man doing judgment with God in the whole Bible? And how does Abraham pray? God, you are the judge of all the earth. It is not right that the righteous and the wicked suffer the same fate. God, that's not who you are. You can't do that. You cannot bring devastation and destruction on Sodom until my kids are out, until my family is out. Because you are a righteous judge. You promised me my family. You promised me they would walk with me in heaven. You said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in you and your house. That's your word, God. It's in Acts 16, 31. I believe it. I declare it. I will not back off from it. Now, I invoke my covenant and assure mercy in Jesus' name. And whatever deception, whatever person is trying to take my kids down the path to devastation and destruction, Holy Spirit, enter in that and cut it off in Jesus' name and pull them into the kingdom. I say this day they are saved, they are delivered, they are free in the name of the Lord. All right, final scripture. I promise, final scripture, I think. Luke 22, Luke 22. And then I'm gonna pray for you. All right, Luke 22. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Let's see. Luke, the, the very last thing that's spoken by the Lord Jesus in the upper room on the way to Gethsemane. Last words of the upper room, here it is. Verse 35, and he said to them, when I sent you without money bags, sack and sandals, did you lack anything? They said nothing. Then he said to them, but now. But now means the season is changing. Listen, Global Connections, the season is changing. The Lord says to you, the season is changing. And for this seasonal change, in order for you to gain the harvest, you were signed before the foundations of the earth. I have to activate the heart of King David in your life. And I'm coming to you to do it. And you can bank on it. I sent somebody from America to tell you. They don't even live here. They came with my message for you and you can bank on it. It's coming because I'm going to do it because your nation has, was dubbed the great south land of the Holy Spirit and it will serve me in the last days. In Jesus' name. Listen to what the Lord said. But now, he who has a money bag, let him take it. Likewise a sack. He who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Smile at somebody and say, buy your sword. It's time. We have warriors in our midst and we've handcuffed them with our theology. Mercy, 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 mercy. Listen, mercy is awesome when you're in sin and in failure, but mercy is more awesome when you're in righteousness and you've got a harvest field you can't get in because mercy blows the doors off of that place. Covenant mercy, it removes the opposition. In your mercy, cut off. Now, when we get established in that back home, if Donald Trump gets in, we're going to do some carving on that boy and help him look a little more like Jesus (laughs) than he does right now. (laughs) <laughs> I'm excited for you this morning. I'm excited for you because I heard God say what he's going to do. I am going to visit you and I'm going to activate the heart of David in your life. And I'll tell you, once the heart of David is activated in you, it is a different ball game everywhere you go. He will make your enemy your footstool. There is no doubt about that. I mean, that's what David saw. Everywhere he went, God made his enemy his footstool. He prophesied it to us. It was prophesied to us by Peter. It's declared to us in the word. That's who we are. That's where we're going. And the great thing about God is he likes to confound people. Often by picking unusual agents of change. Who gets all the glory in our culture today? Who gets all the emphasis? All the focus is on the young. 
makes me think, what would, what would culture look like if God starting anointing senior citizens? Somebody might rethink whether they want to listen to you. Oh, yeah. Could happen, huh? Could happen. Not only could, it's going to. Hallelujah. It's going to. Praise the Lord. Smile at somebody and say, the heart. God's going to activate the heart of David. All right, saints, stand up. I want to pray it over you right now in Jesus' name. Stand up. I heard it. Now I have to declare it. All right. Now we went through enough word that you have the faith to add to this and say, okay, God, here I am. Bring it in Jesus' name. Here I am. I want it. I want to see it. Bring it forth. Now I know what it looks like. I'm in. I'm in and I want it. Hallelujah. Lift hands toward heaven. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for global connection. I thank you for this divine uh, connection today. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. I declare over them that you are activating the heart of David in this people. Every man, every woman, every child. Father, every person in this house, visit them in Jesus' name. And I call forth the heart of David. Just like it's viewed in Scripture. Just like Jesus said he would represent it in the last days. He is the root and the fruit of David. David. And Lord, I ask you, honor what your leadership has walked through all these years of service. You know the blood that's in the street that has been shed by them. You know the adversity that they've walked through. Now, Father, I ask you to honor them. I ask you to bless them. Lord, I'm asking you for the fullness of the heart of David. Let it be activated and let it come forth. And let the world once again see King David in action. Hallelujah. Everywhere. Father, let King David, the authority, the power, the resoluteness, Father, the attitude, the anointing, the heart, let it be seen in the earth and bring forth the fullness of harvest of nations as only you can. Lord, I declare it over this people. I decree it over them. I call it forth in Jesus' name. Now, Father, for every joint that's registering complaint and pain. Every place in these bodies that hurts. If they're going to carry the heart of David, they have to have a healed body to do it in. So Lord, in Jesus' name, rebuild these body parts. Set them free right now in Jesus' name. Let your healing hand and your healing touch be on this people. And Father, let them rise up in the morning and let them know that they will run and not be merry. They will walk and not faint. Lord, I declare it over them. I'm calling it forth, and I'm saying it right now. In Jesus' name, heart of David, come forth in the name of the Lord. Come forth in Jesus' name. Come forth. Be activated now in the name of the Lord. Come forth in Jesus' name. Salt, 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 salt. Let your salt be recharged. Let your salt bin be refilled. Let your pores ooze out the authority of divine salt. And may you walk on the enemy every step you take. In Jesus' name. I decree it. I declare it. I count it done. In the name of the Lord. And everyone agreed by saying. Amen. Amen. And start right here, Lord. Hallelujah. You know, everything starts with a choice. Word of God says, choose you this day who you're going to serve. You may be in this meeting today and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. You may be in this meeting today and you're sort of backed away from God or backed away from the call of God, backed away from the, what God is doing in your life. And today you're dormant. You're not moving. You're not heading towards your destiny or, or whatever God has for you. And I believe today there are many people like that in this house that really need that touch from God today, that really activate. First of all, if you don't know Jesus Christ, give your life to Christ. Ask Him to come into your life. Ask Him to forgive you your sins. If you've drawn away, if you've backed off because of circumstances, situations, whatever it might be, come back to Him. 
It's the only way for you to really find your destiny and your purpose. But for those that have had a call of God on your life, that have, you too have sort of backed away from it, you need to come back to that too. I just want you to bow your heads with me for a moment right now. And if God has spoken to you, if anything that I've just spoken about right there, right then, you know that God's talking to you and that you need to make a choice. You need to, need to make a decision today. I'm going to really, really focus. I'm going to pay, give that, this thing attention. I'm going to make it right. I want to make it right. I believe today is a day of choice to choose. And, and if you're one of those people today that need to make that choice, would you just quickly, in the presence of God, just slip up your hand and say, that is me today. That is me today. Come on. Come on. That is me today. I need to do that today. I need to do that today. Today, today, today. I need to do that. Father, you see those hands. You see those people right now. You, it, it's not too late to raise your hand. It's not too late to say, I, I need to d allow God into my life. I need to uh, let God be God, to be the champion, to, to take me to that place, to take me to that place. Lord, you, you've said great things, but my God, unless there's a response from us, it'll never happen. That's what you want to do. That's what your will is. So today we get connected with what you want to do, your will, my God. And we say, not my will, but your will, so that you can do whatever you want to do in our lives. We're totally yours. So, Father, you see those hands, and I ask you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, right now to pour out your Spirit upon them, pour out your love upon them, draw them to yourself, revealer of truth, reveal your position to them. Lord, reveal what you have for them in Jesus' name, and we'll give you all the praise, we'll give you all the glory. And everybody said, Amen.